these things chime definitely. I, you know, when I saw the telescope, I looked at it and it's like, it's a half pipe, <laughs> you know, yes, the, the wired story saying that you don't look quite like a normal telescope, but obviously it is doing an amazing job of detecting these. Um, it's, it's quite mind blowing. The question is why study them at all? I mean, what does this actually tell us about the universe? Yeah, what are they, right? Um, so part of this, uh, I'm a cosmologist. So my bias always comes down to this is fundamental science. This is trying to understand the workings of reality and how it is that everything's put together. And one of the things about fundamental science is that it's it's hard to tie it directly to some innovation we'll have tomorrow. You know, When people were studying electromagnetism in the 1800s, they did not imagine cell phones and uh, you know, streaming conferences or anything like that, <laughs> but it's all it's all necessary. Um, from the fast radio burst standpoint, I, I think from an astronomical standpoint, it's kind of exciting that this is this is a new realm that's opened up. Uh, we couldn't even search radio data for this sort of stuff until computing power had reached a certain level because it's just there's so much data that comes off these things. Uh, Chime is a terabyte per second. You know, it fills up a laptop hard drive every second of every day, wow. <laughs> all the time. And searching through years of that uh, it just wasn't possible until, well, the last couple of decades. And it's kind of amazing that as soon as we open up a new window on the universe, that we can look at this, say, high time resolution universe, rather than just taking a long exposure, uh, what does it look like on shorter time scales? Suddenly, there are these crazy new phenomena popping up. Um, it really is. Uh, it's indicative of how much more there is out there to learn about how things work. And if this is something from a magnetar, it tells us uh, a lot about how physics can behave in these really weird environments. So magnetars, like I said, it's a highly magnetized neutron star, <laughs> which is a complex sentence. But the magnetic field on that, it's something like a million billion times stronger than the magnetic field on Earth. It's strong enough that it pulls apart atoms. It does crazy things to uh, the, the matter there. And if this gives us a way to understand it, great. Uh, it may be that these can be used for, well, cosmology. My, my bias comes back into it. They're coming at, to us from billions of light years away. That provides us with a backlight to different parts of the universe and a backlight that's impulsive. So it's just one pulse. And then we can study how that travels through everything on its way to us. So you can start to pick apart how structure evolved in the universe and how that plays into these other questions of you know, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? And are they something that we can eventually wrap our heads around and make use of? Yeah. Um, now you talked about, you know, catching it, um, you know, it's bright, super bright, and then it's gone. But can we talk about the repeaters? Because these, this is a relatively new discovery and discovered by Canadian as well. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that about them because they seem pretty interesting. Yeah, so the, the first, uh, well, five or six uh, fast radio bursts were just that, they were fast bursts. And they, they were what the Scientific American article described it as, a brilliant flash, then nothing. And then that first one out of Arecibo did it multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> it flashed and flashed and flashed, and then it stopped for a while. And then many months later, it flashed and flashed again. Uh, and that was a real surprise to everyone. First, that it was amazing that, it, it, that these were confirmed as real astronomical objects. And then that this was slightly different from the others. And now in Chime, we see both. We see one-offs and we see repeaters. And it may be that we're actually looking at different things. We, we still don't know if this is one class of objects or multiple. Uh, it, they, they do sort of qualitatively have slightly different features to them. Uh, and that's not really nailed down yet, but there is some thought in the community that there are at least two categories of, of things going on here. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's so interesting because they're so recent. I mean, like you said, uncovered in 2007. Um, you know, who knew? And who knows, I guess, maybe there's another class or something like that, that you might have. Exactly. It's maybe it's five different things going on. And as we study them deeper and deeper and get more and more samples, we can start to tease these apart. Uh, that's why an experiment like Chime, where instead of getting one or two from the last decade, you get, you know, hundreds a year, uh, really stands 
in a great position in the field. <laughs> you know, we're yeah. making huge strides in this. Sort of month by month, something amazing comes through my inbox. And uh, really? it's really an, it's an exciting field to be in. Yeah, for sure. I, and you didn't, who saw this coming, right? <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Um, okay, so first I want to invite people to send in questions um, because th these things are pretty fascinating and I'm sure you have many questions to ask. But I'm just going to put it out there because I know the question, anytime I write about it, are they truly astronomical or is it aliens? <laughs> yeah, is it aliens? Uh, certainly early on, uh, the first handful, there were a number of papers arguing this could be aliens um, for various reasons. Uh, some people thought they saw a periodicity that they only came every so often from different directions. Uh, that did not <laughs> bear out. Uh, some people have argued that uh, this could be you know, ex aliens using light sails. So they are broadcasting huge amounts of power at their spaceships to accelerate them, and we're getting a little bit of spillover. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, that to me seems unlikely because they would have to be spread all over the universe and have been doing this over billions of years. <laughs> so it's it's tough for it to be aliens just because of the, the span of space and time that it seems to occupy. These yeah. have been going on for billions of years and they, for all intents and purposes, will continue to go on for billions of years. <laughs> yeah. What about, I mean, time is so unique. But are there other, like you're working on some other ones, I believe, like it's similar telescopes. Can you talk about that? Sure. So uh, there are a couple of extensions, actually. Um, the first thing that's happening, uh, Chime is great, uh, but it's we can only tell where these are coming from to about uh, a square arc minute. Um, that's 1 60th of a degree on each side. Uh, so it's, it's a small region of space. It's about the resolution of the human eye, right? Uh, we can see about an arc minute. Uh, but it turns out that if you look inside an arc minute at the distances that we can tell where these are, there are dozens or hundreds of galaxies that it could be coming from. We can't we can't tell just from that. So one of the big extensions is that we're building tiny chimes, uh, little single cylinders in different places around North America to tie in with the main one. And those will, along with chime, let us pinpoint where these are coming from. And then we can see you know, what galaxy, where in the galaxy, how they're distributed over cosmic history, uh, how they're distributed spatially much better. Um, we'll be able to say a lot more about the origins of these with that. And then separately, uh, Chime has been operating for a few years and you know, technology marches on. We thought we had an incredible piece of sort of miraculous engineering at the time, and we did. And you know, it's still great, but the computational power in the last five years has blown up. Uh, we, we can do amazing things beyond what we could do then. And even just the communications technology, right? We're borrowing things from cell phones and cell phones have changed a lot in five years. Uh, if you go and dig out your five-year-old cell phone, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> um, but so, so there's a lot that can be done. So there are a couple of new telescopes coming up. This one in South Africa, which is uh, ultimately aims to be a thousand small dishes, five or six meters, uh, called Hyrax. And there's another one in Canada, which is going to be sitting next to CORD, or next to CHIME. It's called CORD, Canadian Hydrogen Observatory and Radio Transient Detector, uh, which is made up of hundreds of these small dishes again. Uh, and it's a little closer to that cartoon that I showed of just dropping detectors all over the ground and processing the whole thing. Um, so as technology marches on, and as we understand, well, the science and the questions that we're asking better, we're coming out with bigger and better, you know, fancier, more sensitive observatories. So cord, we we hope you know on paper it's about an order of magnitude more sensitive. So that that again can can revolutionize our understanding. So is chime um, like is there is it easily adaptable? Like can you change the technology, like the the components to it, so that it can become even more sensitive or what you need to do? Yeah, it depends on how invasive we want to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we want to change the color, you know, the frequency band that it's looking at. That's pretty invasive. Uh, that that mm. gets to be a lot of work to upgrade it that way. It may happen someday, but uh, immediately, no. If you want to add other science cases where we're just taking that same data and reprocessing it, that's a matter of writing new software. Uh, and that's something that we're doing constantly. Uh, there, there are now something like a dozen different experiments running on Chime, taking that same data and rechewing it in different ways. Uh, and that's that's really been, the I think, the revolutionary thing about it, that having 
all of this work being done in computers means you can change what all of this work means. <laughs> you can add on an FRB search. You can add on pulsar monitoring. You can add on mapping of galactic magnetic fields. You can add on dozens of new things. Uh, and that's that's the sort of thing that's let us you know, adapt it. Chime was already well underway in, in its design and construction by the time FRBs were even shown to be real. So really? it wasn't being built for fast radio bursts. And now it's having a huge impact there. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, can we, we talk about, I mean, because it was quite exciting when the source was traced back to a magnetar and specifically in our galaxy. Um, you know, my question is, so are we going to see more of these in our own galaxy as opposed to in other galaxies? Yeah, is I, that a I, I think, it, oh, it's certainly a possibility. I, I think it would be reasonable to assume that, yes, uh, there should be more either from this this magnetar that we've already seen, maybe it has another outburst, maybe it doesn't, uh, or from others. There, there are other known magnetars in our galaxy. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we start detecting uh, other ones you know, from locally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from only tens of thousands of light years away instead of billions. Uh, yeah, and from other nearby galaxies, uh, when things are near, you can see fainter bursts. So it, it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, there are fewer things to do it, but you know, there's a trade-off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what would happen if one of these were close to Earth? Uh, you know, and not not ten thousand light years, not fifty thousand. Let's say, you know, a few light years away, or tens or twenty. Yeah, I I genuinely don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, the amount of energy that these things put out, it's probably beamed. So there's some you know small coming at us. But if they're emitting it in every direction, if you just take the naive guess, they're putting out in a millisecond sort of what the sun does in a year. Uh, so it's a lot of energy dumped very fast. And if you had something nearby doing that, it would probably be noticeable. I, I imagine it would be uh, minimally something like a serious solar storm uh, and probably a whole lot more than that. Yeah. Not good, probably. It's basically good. what we're saying. Not good. Yeah. I, we're pretty confident there's nothing like that in our immediate neighborhood, though. Yes. Yes. You know, people are always worried about that, though. You know, you always talk about the end of the world and um, in astronomical in the astronomical sense. So, okay, so we have these telescopes out there. We have Chime, which is an amazing Canadian uh, invention, homegrown. Um, and, uh, well, here, this question is, so what about us? What about ordinary citizens? What can we do to contribute to this? Yeah, so Chime has actually recently, or Chime FRB has recently uh, started engaging with the Zooniverse, which gets into citizen science. So uh, like I said, we're producing an incredible amount of data and we have software that sifts it down hugely, but it's still really hard to tell a real one from say a microwave, <laughs> uh, a microwave oven. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> And, and just for to automate all possible detections is really tricky. So we've started delivering these to, to partners uh, working on this Zooniverse platform where just you can go, you can sign up, you, can, you don't even need to sign up. You can go and start looking at our data and classifying this is real, this is not. It'll walk you through sort of what real ones look like, what phony ones look like. If it's just someone driving by with a cell phone and our software missed, uh, that's easy for people to tell. And it's surprisingly difficult for software to tell still. Um, so yeah, if you want to get engaged, uh, look up Chime Zooniverse, like universe, but with zoo. Yeah, it's a great, the Zooniverse is great. It has so many other things that you can do there, but uh, FRBs would be a fun one to do. Yeah. Um, okay, what about you? I mean, what is really fascinating about FRBs for you? Some of it is just, the the sort of immediate gratification, yeah. <laughs> uh, the cosmology side, it, it's a longer term haul. Uh, the, that image that I showed from the South Pole Telescope, that's sort of a six month exposure. So you turn on the telescope and you stare and you stare and you stare and you stare and you move it around and you take yeah. pictures constantly for six months and you stack them all up and then it takes years to analyze it and make sense of it. It's, yeah. it's a slow and steady, you know, workmanlike effort to get out the cosmology. And Chime is going to take years to do its cosmology. Uh, FRBs, it was pretty thrilling. We turned it on. And before we even were officially commissioning the thing, events were falling off. Just while we were yeah. testing it, 
stuff was happening. And like I say, almost every week or every month, I get some amazing new thing in my inbox, uh, which is <laughs> neat to see. Yeah. And our students get to work with a telescope and every student has found FRBs at this stage. Uh, they get to, to sit there and watch things come in and characterize them. And uh, there's an immediate gratification in the discovery. And it's fun just being in a new space where we don't even know quite what we're looking at. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's very much the the explorer in me that enjoys this this side of it. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's 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 really one of the wonderful things about um, I would say astronomy cosmology is that every time you know you think you have something figured out or so, there's a new question, right? And you're learning new things. Um, so that finally, I I, I want to ask my what I'm what I've been wondering, I mean, the whole time this FRBs have been going on. And then once we kind of nailed it down to magnetars, could it be coming from magnetars only, or could it be coming from other sources as well? Yeah, that's the thing we're not sure of. Uh, even the one that we saw from the magnetar was not bright enough to explain the FRBs that we see. It's it's a couple of orders of magnitude fainter. It's it's much, much, much brighter burst than we'd seen from a magnetar before. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's not quite in the same class as FRBs that we see from other galaxies. So we think that that could just be down to you know magnetars putting out slightly brighter bursts, younger magnetars that put out more energetic things. Mm -hmm. But like I said, even if they do explain a portion of FRBs, uh, it's it's far from clear if if FRBs are one thing or multiple things. <laughs> These repeaters maybe are different. Uh, there could be multiple classes within repeaters or within one-offs. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a really good chance that this goes a lot deeper than uh, we might immediately think. Yeah, and I mean, really, you still have to understand the mechanism behind what's actually producing it, even if you know that it's coming from a magnetar itself. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> it's from a magnetar. <laughs> How well do we understand <laughs> magnetars? Not well at all. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you answering some of the questions. I mean, we're going to have some more questions coming up uh, soon from the audience. And uh, now we'll turn it over to the Some Questionable News. That was fascinating. Thank you. And Keith, you've primed everybody with your showing that montage of headlines. So for those of you who have tuned in to some RCI science events of the last little while, some questionable news is our attempt to try to have a little fun with uh, fake news detection. So we're going to be showing you some headlines and we want you to guess whether or not these headlines actually appeared in a real news outlet or if we have just made them up. Okay. Got it? Now, our two speakers, Nicole and Keith, are going to be uh, playing along, but we hope all of you will play along as well. And just say real or fake in the comments, in the YouTube chat, or on Facebook uh, Facebook comments. So please, let's see what you have to say. And we are going to start with, researchers created a magic carpet through light. Will this hoverboard make it to NASA? What do you think, real or fake? <sighs> I can buy it. Uh, you can certainly use light to move stuff around. You can apply a force with it. So I wouldn't be too surprised if someone was trying to levitate something <laughs> with light. Uh, calling it a word feels like a stretch, but uh, I'll take it. Okay. I'm with him. You I, think so? Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. So you were talking about light sails earlier. That's kind of related to that, right? Okay. So yes, this is a real headline hey, on the hey. science time. <laughs> the study was just two small mylar plates as wide as a pencil's diameter, and it was in a vacuum chamber. These were lifted by a series of LEDs, and scientists are hoping to use this model to study weather and climate. But the idea is, of course, in the very, very early stages. And there's, of course, a lot of meteorological challenges to this. All right, let's try the next one. I actually really like this one. Earth is fighting a laser duel with the exploding Carina Nebula. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Is this real? Uh, is it fake or is it just uh, real but with a really inventive headline writer? <laughs> I'm going to say it's real with a strange headline. It is a real, uh, yeah. People, I think they're maybe trying to push it, make it look uh, more, I don't know, like Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of what would be lazing in Karina that would come our way. Well, I might say no, just to mix it up. This is maybe made up. Maybe not, Maybe this is made up. Okay, the answer is real, oh, except hey. that it's really 
misleading headline, yes. Yeah. Scientists are firing lasers from the Very Large Telescope. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, astronomers are not that great at naming telescopes. The Very Large Telescope is indeed a very <laughs> large telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. And this laser is simulating distant stars. This helps calibrate the telescope to look at objects like the Carina Nebula. I have a little problem though. Doesn't dual imply that it's actually fighting back? Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. All right. Well, hopefully that's not true. Okay. Well, clearly we're winning. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. All right. Next one. We have an extinction level interstellar yes. asteroid is approaching Earth. Brace for impact. How many times have you read a headline uh, like this? <laughs> Nicole. Too like, many times. So, no. <laughs> no. Oh, uh, I would have said I've read so many of these. <laughs> Brace for impact seems Brace a little optimistic. That's <laughs> Maybe, uh, yeah. If you have an extinction level asteroid approaching, you probably bracing for impact isn't a great idea. Not gonna um, okay, so, so I'm gonna guess maybe yes. You're gonna well, say yes, okay? Yeah, you know it's interesting because it's there are two things here. There could be an interstellar asteroid, but there's no impact. So I'm gonna say no because it's the brace for impact part. But okay. Yeah. Excellent. All That's right. Well, let's see what it's yeah. fake. That's right. Yep. I think that Celia or Carrie made this up. She's... <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay. This weekend's full snow moon. Hands up if you saw the snow moon. The full moon yesterday? Oh, yes, yeah. I did. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It was clear yeah. just enough. Uh, this weekend's full snow moon will split North America into and spark a lantern festival in Asia. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yep. What do you think? Real, fake, or is this is this? Is there, is there any truth to this at all? I, I don't even know what would be meant by split. <laughs> yeah, it's what? And how is it going in Asia? What? Um, uh, yeah, that's a. I, I don't know. I'm going to say fake. Just okay. Know. Okay. I'll so, um, I don't know. What do you think, Keith? I'll, I'll guess real. Real. So this, this, but. this is another example of a weird headline, but it is a real thing. Sunset and moonrise occurred close together on Friday night on the West Coast, but on the East Coast, they occurred together last night. So there was a full moon that was uh, one uh -huh. night in one part of North America and on the other night in the other part of North America because of time zones yes. and because of location. Uh, on the earth where sunset happens and the moon's actual motion. So it's kind of complicated, but it also uh, coincides with the end of Lunar New Year, uh, sometimes called the, the Lantern Festival. So that people celebrate uh, the Lunar yeah. New Year and with Lantern Festival. So um, I hope that anybody who was celebrating had a lovely evening last night. Okay, now we do have one final one. This was a contribution. Uh, Wow. The last yeah. century. Okay. Astronomers find five dozen baby black holes in distant psychotic chaos galaxy. That's okay. I guess, I think psychotic <laughs> chaos galaxy would be the official <laughs> name. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> uh, real or fake? What do you think? Is this a real headline or was this us just really having fun one night? I feel like there was something recently in the news about lots of black holes instead of one in a galaxy where they thought there was a supermassive. So I might say yes. Yeah. I, I'm going to say yes as okay. well. Yep. All this right. is a real and very misleading uh, headline that yeah. I would like to credit my friend Greg, who put this up on Facebook yesterday and said, where did they get this headline? And I said, oh, we got to use that. <laughs> so yeah, this is exactly what you were saying. A whole bunch of small black holes, but obviously the galaxy that they're in looks pretty weird. So I guess that's where the psychotic chaos comes from. But I, you know, that is, you know, is not a real uh, galactic classification type. Um, thank you all for playing. Everybody who played along, uh, we do uh, do this for fun, but also to let you know that sometimes headlines are not just misleading. Sometimes they're just plain wrong. So when you do get a, a, a weird headline perhaps in your social media feed, you might just want to check it out yeah. and make sure or stick with good news sources like Nicole, <laughs> who is always yeah. a very strong writer, does her research and presents excellent stories on the CBC. Thanks very much. Thank you. So now we have some questions from uh, uh, our viewers. Um, and of course, let's, let's start off with interesting something um, uh, perhaps uh, yeah, Keith, this is an interesting question. So can the combined detection FRBs, well, the levels of FRBs, uh, dispersions be utilized to make a map of the ionized concentrations of hydrogen similarly to the CMB image? 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. So like I said, these are, they act as backlights to the, the cosmos. Uh, these are going off, uh, FRBs seem to be coming from billions of light years away. And that means that you can use them to, to measure how much stuff is between you and them. Uh, we're hopeful that we can make a map of how much ionized hydrogen there is, because that dispersion, that that you know, spreading of different colors so that the, the low frequencies of light come in later than the high ones, that tells you directly, you know, that you can read off how many electrons there are between you and the, the FRB. Uh, so if you have enough of them, you can in theory make a, a full 3D map of where all those electrons are, which tells you where the ionized hydrogen is. Uh, the downside here, the, the problem with that, is that it doesn't tell you where along the line of sight they are for any given one. And we think, you know, these could be, there could be some large clump of stuff right around the sources. We're, we're not sure if mm. of that dispersion, how much of it comes from our galaxy, how much of it comes from the host, how much of it comes from the space between. And it's the space between that we want. Mm. So the hope, the thinking is that with large numbers of these, we can actually make that measurement, but it's, it's tougher than we might, we had originally hoped. Mm -hmm. It always is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so are there plans, this one comes in, uh, are there plans to try to correlate uh, fast radio burst data with data from gravitational wave astronomy to see uh, if, if bursts might be caused by collisions between highly dense objects such as black holes? Yeah, uh, certainly there are. Um, we've been talking with uh, the, the people uh, at LIGO and other observatories and trying to set up MOUs uh, and sharing data um, so that we can search events. Um, the tricky thing is time, you know, we see a lot of the sky, we still only see about half a percent of the sky at any given time. So the chances that we happen to catch one of these at the exact right moment, uh, well, it's it's not 100%. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and as people probably know, these gravitational waves, it's really hard to say where exactly they came from. Uh, so associating the two isn't immediately trivial, uh, even if we do get an FRB and a gravitational wave goes off at a similar time. Uh, we know that the gravitational wave arrives immediately. It travels at the speed of light the whole way. Uh, and the light travels a little bit slower because of all that plasma. It travels mm -hmm. at the speed of light, but the speed of light in a plasma. Um, so making the association isn't immediately the simplest thing, uh, but certainly there are efforts ongoing. There, there are discussions between the groups. Uh, so we're working on it. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so I know we talked a little bit about uh, other telescopes that might uh, that are being worked on, but this question uh, came in as well. Are there any plans for CHIME to be expanded with more reflectors for greater resolution and or sensitivity? So that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So that that's one thing that I, I touched on earlier, that we are building these mini chimes across North America just for the greater resolution. Uh, increasing the sensitivity, we would really want to expand the main station substantially. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just kind of expensive. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper to add small ones uh, at different locations. Um, and you get a lot more you know, bang for your buck that way. And a lot of chime really has been optimi optimizing bang for buck because you know, this is this is a Canadian effort, and we don't have the budget of our southern neighbors. Uh, we can't just throw budgets with bees in them. Yeah, <laughs> at, at projects. So yeah, we're we're working on uh, building these small chimes across North America that will tie in with the station for the resolution, so that we can tell where these come from. Uh, is there any uh, uh, interest in having maybe other countries come on board? Kind of, you know like the Canada, France, Hawaii telescope, uh, you know, or something like that where you can get other people involved that you can actually expand. Yeah. The collaboration includes people from, you know, other from the US and and well, mostly just Canada and the US at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit harder because Chime just looks up. So if someone's in France, it's hard for them to see the same part of the sky because they're over here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so there's sort of a natural scale that, that the collaboration grows to that you can build these telescopes, which is roughly you know, North America. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it gets really hard to, to use telescopes in Asia or Europe. Uh, and you can't really use telescopes from, say, South Africa or Australia to, to help out with this. Hmm. So next question is, are the FRBs traced back to a magnetar or a magnetar plus pulsar type neutron star? If former, are the FRBs possibly released during the supernova? If later, 
if it's the latter, sorry, uh, why don't we record it repeating like pulsars? Yeah, so magnetars are uh, just highly magnetized neutron stars. Um, pulsars uh, are also neutron stars, which are spinning rapidly and emitting from their, their magnetic poles. And so as they spin around, we see the light as it sort of sweeps across us like a lighthouse turning around, right? So you see these pulses of light from the pulsar. Uh, magnetars typically don't have that sort of emission. Some of them do have detections in the radio. Uh, this seems to just be a magnetar, not a traditional, it, it doesn't have a traditional pulsar emission mechanism. Um, so, sorry, if the former, what was the? If the former, or the FRB is possibly released during a supernova. Ah, if latter, so I don't this was a magnetar that we knew about previously. It, it's been a magnetar for you know, a long time. Uh, and this seems to have just been an active period, an outburst of some sort. And it's thought that those are caused by uh, not my field of expertise I'm, and not really nailed down. We don't understand magnetar emission fully, but it's thought that it's it's you know, reconfiguration of the crust. So a star quake uh, releasing some amount of energy, uh, releasing material that gets caught up in the magnetic field and accelerated in strange ways and putting out just a lot of energy. Hmm. Um, so, uh, the next one, uh, again, you did touch on this a little bit. Is there a version of chime in the Southern hemisphere? How is all the data that is gathered stored and made available to scientists? That's a good question because that's a lot of data. It's a lot of data. <laughs> so there isn't, uh, an exact version of chime in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, the Australians have a telescope, uh, which they've reconfigured, uh, which is cylinders. They they have these cylindrical, you know, one-dimensional telescopes uh, called uh, Upmost. I guess the telescope is Malonga, mm. but Upmost is the, the FRB searching experiment on it. Um, they've instrumented a smaller region. They only look at a they they look at a smaller region of the sky with it, uh, and have you know commensurately fewer detections. Um, and it doesn't quite work the same way. So it's it's a little bit of a different beast, but. You know, Chime isn't unique in being a cylinder. Um, just after Chime was being built, uh, some South African colleagues uh, got together with us and we started discussing this and ultimately settled on that Hyrax project, which reuses a lot of Chime technology. A lot of the people involved in Chime are involved in that. Uh, so there will be, uh, you know, not cylinders, but <laughs> something using a lot of the developments for Chime being built in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, mm -hmm. But there is no, there is no chime four cylinders in the south. Yeah. Um, so now, well, oh, there, how is the data stored? That was oh the yes, yes, that was a very good question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, it's a lot of data. Like like I said, it's something like a terabyte a second that goes into our computers. Uh, and the sad answer is that the vast vast majority is not stored. Uh, we cannot afford to record it all. Um, basically, if if you miss something, you miss it. So we have to do all of our processing live. We can we can record about a 30 second buffer of that data. And if we find something, then we try to freeze that and, and save it. Uh, but most of the data, uh, if you can't process it, as we say, it falls on the floor. It just, oh. the data runs off the telescope and that's that. We try to process it into whatever form we think we can use it in. Uh, so for the cosmology, we integrate it, we, we just, uh, sum it up, we, we make it a long exposure effectively, and we store snapshots every 10 or 20 seconds, depending on what exactly we're looking at. Um, for the fast radio burst, uh, we process it and feed it to the FRB search. And when something's found, we, we copy out as much data as we can. When nothing's found, we don't. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's sort of the new reality of these radio telescopes that since we can afford to process it, we've built much bigger systems than we ever had in the past. And now we just, we cannot record all the data uh, continuously. It would just, it would overwhelm us. And ultimately we'd have to go back and process it anyway. So the thinking is you have to process it eventually. You might as well do it when you start. Wow. So do you think anything's being missed? I'm sure that? things are being missed. Wow. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that we are missing things uh, constantly. I don't know what they are. If I did, I'd yes. write this algorithm to search for them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's sort of the cost of doing business. Uh, yeah. If we, yeah, if and when we have ideas for what else we can look for, we can build that in and check. And we take occasional dumps of the entire array and just yeah. comb through it and try to understand it and make sure that we understand what's going on. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the uh, honestly downsides of this sort of 
instrument, but uh, you, you do have to leave some things on the table. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all there for the next generation. Wow. Well, it's interesting because it's it's almost like it's too good at doing its job. <laughs> There's so much information coming in. Yep. Wow. Uh, again, I want to invite people to send in their questions. Uh, again, fast radio bursts, really interesting, uh, mysterious signals from space. It's the only time I like using mysterious in a headline because they are really strange. <laughs> um, so uh, another question is, would there be any benefit to setting up a pair of your antenna at right angles or set it up at greater distances from each other? So setting them up at right angles, these are aligned north-south. If you set one up east-west, would that be useful? Mm -hmm. um, the reason that we put it north-south, we see this strip north to south, is that then when the sky rotates overhead, we get the entire northern hemisphere of the sky. Just as the earth rotates, it naturally spins our telescope across everything. Uh, if you put it east-west, you get this narrow band east-west, you'd get a lot more time on each part of the sky because you'd see it from rise to set, uh, but you would not get as much of the sky. Um, you'd just look at each portion more of the day. So uh, is there an advantage? This is actually something that Australian cylinder did. They, this was, it's an old telescope. It was built in maybe the 70s uh, called the Southern Cross. It's, it's a north-south uh, one mile long cylinder, and then an east-west mile long cylinder built on top of it. And that's something that they did uh, back in the day because then you can combine the two and you can sort of steer around where it where it's looking if you're only making one beam, if, if you're looking in one direction. With Chime, we don't do that. We just, we eat the cost and we look everywhere all the time. We have 1,024 of these different beams looking in different directions. So adding an east-west one wouldn't gain us a lot on Chime. Uh, for building ones a little bit farther away to increase the resolution, yeah, that, that's a great idea. That's something we're working on. Yeah, well. So now for the original Chime purpose, has the red shifted 21 centimeter emission signal from the reionization era been detected? Ah, so the reionization era uh, mm -hmm. is a much, it's an early period in the universe's history. Um, when the universe started, it was all a hot, dense plasma, and then it expanded and cooled off. The CMB came out, and then it was just dark and boring for maybe half a billion years. Um, and eventually, these structures formed large enough that you know galaxies were born and stars started to light up. And when that happened, it ionized the universe. All of the energy that was given off by these first stars or first galaxies coming together uh, really, well, it let off a lot of, the entire process isn't fully understood, but it, it reionized all of the hydrogen. So it knocked all the electrons off. Uh, that happened you know, very early on. Um, and that's something that people have been looking for in radio for a long time, because it should be obvious in theory. Before it, all the hydrogen is neutral. So all of this 21 centimeter, this radio glow, everything is glowing that way. And then the universe ionizes and everything stops glowing to first order. So you should see just this step uh, and people have been looking for that since about the 90s with other radio telescopes. Um, Chime can't actually see that. It's looking at a different band of radio light. It's looking at a different portion of the radio spectrum. Uh, we're at higher frequencies than you would need to see that. Uh, so there are a number of other telescopes, primarily uh, in Australia and in South Africa, that are looking for this. Um, and as yet, it has not been detected. Mm. Uh, at least it's not published in any way. <laughs> not yet. Well, still something um, to look forward to. <laughs> there is one publication from uh, a small telescope in Australia that saw what they call the global step, which is the very, very start of reionization. And I think that hasn't been reproduced yet. And it's not, you know, the world isn't yet convinced that it's real. <laughs> but mm. uh, I guess that's the caveat to my statement. It may have been seen. The larger telescopes that are looking for it have not yet seen it. Yeah, that's too bad. Uh, so, okay, you mentioned Canada having less of a budget for instruments compared to the U.S. Uh, can you tell us about any other thrifty uh, Canadian astronomical experiments? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, Chime had to be done on a budget. Uh, everything we do, we, we try to save every possible penny on. Uh, we're kind of cheap about the whole thing. Um, there are others. Uh, a really good example, I think, is the Dragonfly uh, array. This is a series of cameras connected to, well, consumer, well, professional, but uh, lenses. So things that, say, paparazzi would use to get telephoto images of things, uh, you know, large 
sensitive to low light lenses from Canon. Uh, those have been, well, put together into an array with a lot of cameras stuck on the back uh, and used by colleagues here in Toronto uh, and also their, their collaborators in Yale uh, to look for, well, ultra faint galaxies. So they're looking for very, very, very low levels of light. So things, galaxies that don't have many stars doing anything in them. Uh, mm -hmm. And they've made some amazing discoveries. And that, again, is on a, a tremendous budget. And a lot of it comes down to what can we repurpose from the rest of the world? <laughs> you know, astronomers, we, we can't really drive industries forward, but we can look around and see, oh, cell phones, video games, cameras, these are things that exist now. <laughs> and we can repurpose them in, in slightly non-traditional ways to make really good uh, innovative measurements. So Dragonfly, uh, one of the things that they found was they, they found galaxies that are almost entirely made of dark matter, it seems, uh, and kind of a mystery. Uh, th there are great things coming out of that world too. Yeah. So if we can find these neat little niches that they're a space that hasn't been, we haven't been able to study for before. Uh, in, in the case of Chime, it's a lot of this sort of uh, stochastic radio events. So things that happen unpredictably and things that are fast uh, generally in radio, it's a new new space that we can explore. Mm -hmm. And in the case of you know Dragonfly, looking for these really, really faint surface brightness things, just galaxies that are really hard to see because they're not putting out much light. Who, I, I, if you can refresh my memory, who university in Toronto who, who's running that? Or Bob involved? Abraham is leading that. Sorry? Abraham, Bob Abraham? That's it. That's that's great. Yeah. Um, well, it's exciting. And I mean, that's the thing, I, I suppose, in your you know, in the astronomical field, you just sit back and wait for some great technology for cameras, phones, and you like, how can we use this? Yeah, I wish we could sit back and wait. But yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so uh, another uh, question um, is, uh, do you work with other teams studying FRBs across Canada and internationally? And if so, what has the experience been like? Yeah, um, the the FRB world is pretty collaborative. It's it's been really nice. Uh, so, for example, that repeater, the first FRB that Chime found that was a repeater, uh, first second one of the early ones that we found, uh, we we worked with a team in Europe to to localize it to figure out what galaxy it's in. Because uh, again, Chime can narrow down where it is. But there are just there's still dozens to hundreds of galaxies in the region that we see. Mm -hmm. So we worked with uh, a team uh, primarily out of Astron uh, in the Netherlands um, mm -hmm. to use telescopes, more traditional radio telescopes spread across the Earth uh, to look to to detect future bursts and figure out exactly where mm -hmm. that object is. Um, and in the case of say the Magnetar, uh, when we detected it, we it was actually way outside Chime's main field of view. We just were searching and it we caught it out of the corner of our eye, but it was so bright that it lit up, I think it was 93 of our thousand pixels that we see. So it, it was bright enough that it sort of splashed across the whole sky. Uh, and we saw it and we put out a little notice and we noticed that it was coming from the Magnetar and that was exciting. They don't usually have this sort of burst. And there was a US team that took that and went and looked it up and found, goodness, this thing is really bright. <laughs> and we sort of you know, talked to them and uh, put out papers simultaneously uh, describing the event. Uh, and a lot of these things uh, you know, depend on other communities. In that case, we also you know, worked with X-ray groups uh, that, that are operating X-ray telescopes to see that there was an X-ray flare on, from the Magnetar at the same time uh, and look to be associated. And that helped really nail down where it was coming from. So yeah, we, we, we try to collaborate as much as possible with as many groups as possible, because I, honestly, more heads are better than fewer. <laughs> these things are often complicated uh, and having a lot of eyes on the problem is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in, in this field in general, in cosmology, astronomy, all that seems to be a very collaborative um, field. I mean, it's a big yeah, universe. <laughs> There's a race. We're competitive. We're trying to get yeah. these things before everyone else does. But uh, that said, we know that we're yeah. all on the same side. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so, uh, question: Has SETI uh, expressed in, uh, any interest? Uh, so, the, the SETI Institute have they expressed any interest in searches going through your data for intelligence signals? Going back to the whole alien idea. Yeah, uh, there, there have been a few discussions back and forth with that. Uh, I, nothing uh, is is sort of formalized yet, but we have discussed what that would look like and and how that could be done. That's uh, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it, it could be interesting. SETI searches are pretty expensive because that's a, um, you don't know what the signal you're looking for is. Yeah. Uh, and typically the thing that they look for, things like really, really, really narrow band emission that doesn't get produced naturally. Yeah. Uh, it's computationally expensive to do that and getting through all our data that way. Uh, it would be a significant um, upgrade and rework of a lot of the computing. So yeah, we, we we're having discussions. We're looking at building that into some of the future ones from the get go. Uh, and yeah, I think it's it's a worthwhile thing to search for in parallel with all these others. Since these are these funny digital telescopes where it's it's all you can clone data and it, it's not doing A or B, it's doing A and B <laughs> and C and D and E and you know, doing all of these projects at once. It makes sense to try and get these, these value add things. Even if you think, or I think, uh, a priori low probability of finding something, I, I think it's a worthwhile effort because you know high reward. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Amazing. That would be. Uh, so now uh, a question, uh, are these small innovative experiments the way of the future? Or is it large installations like ALMA? Or could this be a combination of both? That's a great question. Uh, I, I think it has to be both. There are so many things that ALMA or you know, the next generation radio telescope, the square kilometer array that's proposed, uh, these huge observatories can do other things that these smaller, uh, what are sometimes referred to as boutique experiments mm. uh, can do. The, the boutique ones are, are sort of smash and grab. We, we, can, we can put together some, some quick test, uh, some high risk, high reward thing on a limited budget and put it out there and check uh, and hopefully make huge advances. But uh, once once people are, well, these big observatories, they, they can do things that we just can't do. Like Chime is fixed on the ground. It's <laughs> to the ground. <laughs> we cannot steer it. We can't follow objects. We can't take long integration. We can't sort of look at them for a long time and see what they do. Uh, and that's that's a necessary trade-off in the design. Making the thing steerable would have made it hundreds of times more expensive. But that means that it's it's blind to a lot of things. So I, I think you really do ultimately need both of these. I mean, even for Chimes studies, when we're trying to when we localized that repeater, uh, that depends on these huge telescopes, the Arecibo and Effelsberg, a hundred meter dish in Germany, and the Green Bank, a uh, hundred meter dish, were used for that. So you need these big facilities even just to do the things that I've been talking about. And, you know, X-ray telescopes, those are hundreds of million dollar sort of uh, jobs. So it, it, takes, it takes both, even if you're only interested in the stuff that Chime can do, and to do all of the stuff beyond what Chime can do. Uh, observatories are, are, you know, they're, they're a critical piece of this. Uh, having these, these big international efforts, I think it helps a lot, and it pushes a lot of envelopes uh, in technology development, uh, in well, the science generally. It makes people think of what you can do with some some giant telescope. Uh, meanwhile, you can take a smaller budget. You can put something together quickly with some grad students and <laughs> half a dozen uh, faculty from across the country, and you can do amazing things. Yeah. Would, would there be any interest or would there be any benefit really to sending a telescope into space that could look for FRBs? Yeah, the the one place that I think might be really nice uh, is a dark side of the moon telescope. That's been my dream for you know as long as I've been doing radio astronomy. Uh, because on Earth, there's just so much junk. People make so much noise. Uh, it's true in visible light. You know, we have all of these street lights, we have City Glow and Starlink mm -hmm. things now overhead and no end of, of light producing objects. Uh, and you just get a clearer picture when you get above all that. Uh, and in radio, it's it's honestly a lot worse. There, there are blindingly bright things all over the planet uh, from cell phone transmitters to cell phones. 
uh, to radio towers, to airplanes, to every satellite that goes overhead. Uh, and all of those are easy to confuse for these sudden blips because they also make sudden blips. So for example, that Green Bank uh, fast radio burst, the, the second or third telescope to discover uh, an FRB, I, they had an automated system to go through and search and they still had to have a student go through, I think it was 6,000 mm -hmm. candidates <laughs> to see if any of them were real. And you can only imagine how that student felt after you know five thousand false ones <laughs> before finding the real one. Um, so yeah, I think getting above the RFI and getting something between yeah. us and the Earth, like say the Moon, would be yeah. good. Uh, but now, of course, people are landing on the dark side of the Moon, and there will be all sorts of radio towers there before we know it. Yeah, yeah, no, I hope hopefully not, <laughs> because I know there has been a lot of talk about using the dark side of the moon for that purpose, you know, for different experimentation, like very, very different searches. Uh, that would be uh, something else. And and what could you you mentioned starquakes? What are some of the leading theories as to what is producing what could be possibly producing uh, these FRBs? if it is indeed a, on a magnetar? This gets way beyond my expertise. I'm not sure that right. I should <laughs> venture an explanation. Um, well, just anything that, that's out there, like if, you know, so starquakes, is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the energy comes from the magnetic field. Uh, these things have huge magnetic fields and it's transferring some energy from that into a radio emission. And the, mm -hmm. the, the basic model that I've seen is that for some reason, some material gets kicked up from the surface into where the magnetic field is you know, rotating quickly and mm -hmm. strange things are happening, there are knots, and it gets really stirred up and superheated by that magnetic field. Uh, and then it just emits uh, in these, these small clumps of gas, fire out some emission, um, which can be anything from X-ray down to radio. Uh, and it may be continuous or clumpy across the whole range. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's that's honestly as far as I've got into the explanation because I think it's yeah. still it's such an exotic state of matter. I mean, neutron stars alone are something that we have a really hard time understanding and explaining the physics of. So neutron stars with crazy magnetic fields embedded in them, uh, it's it's at the edge of astrophysics. It's not something yeah. we understand well, and why they would be producing these things, I think, is going to help explain that rather than yeah the other way around. Neutral and, and it's such a new field. I mean, like we just found them in 2007. Well, then we found repeater just after that. And then we're just, you know, now we're, we finally found one locally. So I guess mm -hmm. it's, it's all just evolving really. And it's evolving very fast. Uh, actually great segue there. Speaking of fast, have there <laughs> been any collaborations with the Chinese fast Tianyin radio telescope group? Right. So the FAST telescope, uh, for people who don't know, is it's like Arecibo in the sense that it's it's a giant fixed bowl of a dish. Uh, but Arecibo is 300 meters wide. FAST is 500 meters wide. It's, it's half a kilometer across. It is you know, the largest radio telescope by a lot now. Uh, and accordingly, the most sensitive. Um, they have a hard time doing searches because they, again, see you know a billionth of the sky at any given time. Um, but Yes, there have been uh, some collaborations. I believe they looked at the magnetar and confirmed a radio emission just after. Uh, so this isn't direct collaboration, but it's sort of trading off. It's the way science typically works, that we put out something, someone else looks at it, and then upgrades it. And then someone else upgrades that. And you sort of you build off each other's work. Um, so yeah, after the original burst had been sort of mentioned, they steered fast over and took a look at it. Uh, steered, they, they do it like Arecibo. They steer the the reflector and they distort the dish a little bit. They don't move the whole bowl. Um, so that they were able to look at it and confirmed that more bursts came out. Uh, they were fainter than the, the one that we caught, but because they're so sensitive, they could see much fainter bursts. So yeah, FAST is an, uh, another sort of mega facility, which is amazing uh, and can do incredible things that Chime can't quite do. Yeah. But it's great to have a new telescope, you know, uh, again, that can uh, look at it differently. Yeah. And now the final question uh, comes in and it says, when will the Chime team get their Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I am not making bets on that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm going to stay away from that. I think it's... it's... <laughs> 
<laughs> Probably it, less to the experts. It is uh, quite the achievement, though, and it's definitely something I think that we can be very proud of uh, in Canada. And it's going to be so exciting, you know, when I first, uh, you know, record, like I first did my interview with uh, one of the Chime uh, collaborators, one of the, uh, the scientists, they're like, yeah, we went from detecting a few of these to the possibility of detecting hundreds of these in a week or whatever. And just, yeah. that's just amazing. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So congratulations to you and your team. 